In May of this year, a sister reported to me that Sister Lou told her at least three church leaders were false leaders who didn't do practical work. And the brothers and sisters couldn't discern these false leaders. After I heard her report, I thought to myself that Sister Lou was too arrogant. If these three church leaders were really such a problem, wouldn't they have been replaced long ago? Behind their backs, Sister Lou claimed these leaders were false leaders. Wasn't she judging the leaders by doing this? When I thought of this, I began to hold a certain view of Sister Lou. I thought she might have a poor humanity. So I decided I should look into Sister Lou's humanity and usual behavior. I'd like to see if she often spoke badly of people behind their backs. Once I started looking into it, I learned that to her brothers and sisters, Sister Lou said a leader lacked discernment and didn't do practical work. Then I suspected even more strongly that Sister Lou had bad intentions and wanted to be a leader herself. So she always criticized the leaders among brothers and sisters. And she chose to spread prejudice against the leaders, to disrupt church order and hinder the leaders' work. If Sister Lou really wanted to protect the work of the church, when she noticed false leaders in the church, she should report upwards. Then their superiors would investigate, verify, and ask what other believers thought. And if they discovered there was a false leader, they would be able to handle it appropriately. Yet Sister Lou did not report the situation. Instead, she constantly talked about the problems to brothers and sisters. What she was doing was judging leaders. So I went to fellowship with Sister Lou. I told her, you should report upwards if you see problems. Don't speak carelessly in front of brothers and sisters. What you're doing will make them prejudiced against the leaders and uncooperative with the leaders' work. This is destructive to church work. You've talked about several leaders behind their backs, and this is judging them. I told her she needed to reflect on her intentions and goals when she was saying these things. And finally, I warned her, if you continue judging leaders behind their backs like this, disrupting church work, you could lose your chance to perform your duties. When I talked to Sister Lou, I felt I had fulfilled my responsibilities as a leader and protected the church's work. Unexpectedly, one day at a meeting, an upper leader asked me, Why did you dismiss Sister Lou from her duties? What did she do wrong? This unexpected question confused me. I thought, I never dismissed Sister Lou. I don't know anything about her dismissal. My leader then told me that the problems Sister Lou reported were real, and the leaders she reported were really false and had to be replaced. My leader told me I had been hasty in handling Sister Lou. He said because she had reported problems with leaders, I had assumed she was arbitrarily judging and not a good person. I was suppressing and condemning God's chosen people, just like the CCP does creating a white terror atmosphere, where truth-tellers are suppressed and punished. After my leader dealt with me, it was difficult to accept. I didn't think I was creating an atmosphere of fear, nor did I want to punish Sister Lou. And it was the leaders at Sister Lou's church who replaced her. I wasn't directly involved in it. How did that make me like the CCP? After that, I couldn't stop wondering why my leader dealt with me like this. Where was I going wrong? I thought back on what my leader said that I had characterized Sister Lou's actions as judging the leaders, immediately after which she was suppressed and dismissed. Without my words, would she have been dismissed? I reflected on the event. I thought, it's true I wasn't the one who dismissed Sister Lou, and I also didn't deliberately punish or suppress her. However, I was a leader. 
My characterization of her problem is arbitrarily judging leaders. Gave brothers and sisters a bad impression of her. So when she experienced some problems performing duties, her church leaders thought she'd like to judge people and was not a good person and performed her duty badly, so they dismissed her. What set off the chain of events that led to her dismissal was my determination of her. Yes. yes. But what was my basis for determining she was guilty of judging the leaders? Was what she did really judging people? Reflecting on this, I found I held some flawed views on the subject. I thought reporting leaders had to be done according to a process. Speak directly to the leader or raise the issue with their superior leaders and let them investigate and handle it. Otherwise, you were judging dishonestly. Sister Lou said there were problems with leaders, but she hadn't told the leaders themselves or reported the issues to their superiors. Instead, more than once, she told her brothers and sisters that the leaders were false for speaking doctrine without doing real work. I thought her behavior constituted judging others. So I condemned her based on my perception of her behavior without actually investigating whether the problems with leaders she talked about were actually genuine. I see. If what Sister Lou said was true and these people were false leaders, then she was doing this to expose false leaders. She was upholding truth and acting justly, meaning she was responsibly protecting the work of God's house. Yes. Someone who dares to truthfully report problems without fear of the status and power of false leaders is a good person in God's house, a person we should cultivate. Right. If problems they report don't match the facts, or if they falsely accuse leaders and workers, this is slander and framing, judging people arbitrarily and disturbing church work. And such a person is an evildoer who should be handled according to principles. Yes. Now the facts proved that the leaders reported by Sister Lou were indeed false leaders who didn't do practical work. Everything she reported was factual. She wasn't judging the leaders at all. She was honestly exposing false leaders. Someone with a sense of justice like her deserves to be supported, not rashly accused and carelessly condemned. Exactly. exactly. If we accuse people like that, no one will dare to speak the truth. Before this, when I discovered leaders with serious problems, I didn't dare speak up because I feared this was judging leaders. But now I understand that if we discover any leaders or workers actually acting against principles, discussing and discerning it with our brothers and sisters isn't judging anyone. It is learning discernment. Yes. Mm -hmm. The key point here is whether the problems that are discussed are true. That's right. When people share facts, they are not judging others. If what they say isn't true, and they are making a big fuss about others' small problems and corruptions, spreading them carelessly, then they are actually judging others. Yes. I didn't understand what it meant to expose false leaders and to judge people. I didn't seek principles or have any fear of God in my heart. And so I condemned a good person. If my leader hadn't found out that Sister Lou's dismissal was unprincipled and hadn't stopped it, I would have done something wicked. Yes. Yes. As I reflected on this, I felt a deep sense of guilt as I realized I was wrong. So I went before God and prayed, expressing my willing acceptance of His judgment and asking for His guidance in understanding my own corruption. Thank, Thank God. God. I saw a passage of God's Word the second paragraph of Religious Service Must Be Purged. I'll read it for you. All right. All right. Serving God is no simple task. Those whose corrupt dispositions are unchanged can't serve God. If your disposition has not been judged and chastised by God's words, then your disposition still represents Satan which proves that you serve God out of your own good intentions, that your service is based on your satanic nature. 
You serve God with your natural character and according to your personal preferences. You always think the things you wish to do will delight God, and the things you do not wish to do will disgust God. You work entirely according to your own preferences. Can this be called serving God? Ultimately, there will not be the slightest change in your life disposition. Instead, your service will make you even more stubborn, thus deeply ingraining your corrupt disposition. And as such, there will be formed within you rules about serving God that are mainly based on your character and experiences from your service based on your disposition. These are man's experiences and lessons and philosophy for life. People like this can be classed as Pharisees and religious officials. If they never wake up and never repent, they are sure to become false Christs and antichrists who deceive people in the last days. False Christs and antichrists will arise from among such people. If those who serve God follow their own character and their own will, they run the risk of being cast out at any time. Those who use their years of experience in serving God to win others' hearts, to lecture them and control them and to stand on high, and who never repent, confess their sins, or renounce the perks of status. These people shall fall before God. They are of the same kind as Paul, exploiting and flaunting their seniority. God will not bring people like this to perfection. Such service interferes with the work of God. People always cling to the old, to the notions of the past, to everything from times gone by. This is a significant obstacle to their service. If you cannot throw them off, these things will throttle your whole life. God will not remotely commend you, even if you break your legs running or your back with your labor, or even if you're martyred in your service of God, but he will call you an evildoer. Amen. Amen. God's word precisely revealed my state. I was a leader for a long time so I felt I had experienced much, had some grasp of principles, had learned from experience, and gained perspective on dealing with people and problems. I became arrogant with no heart space for God. And when things happened, I thought I knew what was going on. So when I had my own ideas, I believed I was right about the way things should be done. I didn't pray to seek principles. I just practiced the way I thought was correct. When Sister Lou's issues were reported to me, I didn't pray to God at all. And I didn't seek out the truth or ways to act according to principles in this matter. I reacted by assuming that she judged others and was not a good person. So I went looking for whether her humanity was bad, whether she often mentioned leaders' problems when she was with others. When I learned that Sister Lou was talking about issues of another leader, I characterized her as judging people and destroying church work. According to principle, I should have gone to the people involved and investigated what she said about the leaders and learned whether they did practical work or whether they were false leaders. Then I can accurately determine the matter and confirm whether what she said was true. Mm -hmm. But because of my own self-righteousness and rashness, I didn't seek principle and my heart had no fear of God. And so I characterized her blindly, which led to her being replaced, suppressed, and excluded. I nearly ruined a good person. God's house has always emphasized we should support God's chosen ones in reporting problems, protect those who raise opinions to leaders and workers, investigate thoroughly when God's chosen people report leaders and workers, and handle things fairly. Despite this, because of my arrogance, I labeled someone, didn't act with principle, suppressed a good person, protected false leaders, and violated principles of God's house. Yes. Mm -hmm. The false leaders shirked practical work and damaged the church's work. 
but instead of handling them, I condemned the person who reported the problem. Am I a protector of false leaders? I shared in these false leaders' wickedness. I became Satan's accomplice. When I reflected, I realized I was arrogantly doing evil and was resisting God. If this continued, God would despise me and reject me. That's, That's true. true. Without resolving arrogance, we easily resist God. Yes. This matter serves as a warning to me. In the future, I shouldn't trust myself so easily. I must seek the truth more and act according to principles to align with God's will. Yes. While reflecting, I recalled my leader said I created a white terror like the CCP. And the more I thought, the truer that seemed. After I accused Sister Lou of judging people, I told her not to talk about leaders and workers' problems carelessly and warned her she could lose her duty if she continued. How is my approach any different from the Great Red Dragons? There's no freedom of speech in China. People cannot talk about state officials. When they do, they are anti-party. And they will be arrested and tortured in many ways so that they will submit and not speak out. Anyone who dares expose the party is convicted of subversion of state power and sentenced to jail. Any disaster in the Great Red Dragon's country or any news unfavorable to the CCP cannot be reported, and anyone who reports it is leaking state secrets and will be sentenced. Yes. If officials are ever negligent or derelict in their duties, the people are not allowed to expose them. If anyone posts comments online, in light cases, the police threaten them and in worse cases, charge them with a crime. All of it is done to silence people through fear. If you're angry, you have to swallow it. People live in timidity and fear and lose their freedom of speech. Thinking about what I did, I saw it created the CCP's white terror atmosphere. If one said something bad of leaders, I carelessly accused them of judging the leaders to silence them and create a sense of fear so that God's chosen live timidly, not daring to expose false leaders, because they feared the leaders would make their lives difficult. Sister Lou had reported false leaders, but I condemned her. If one day I showed problems or deviations in my own duties, but instead of reporting to my superiors, the brothers and sisters discussed me amongst themselves, and I heard about it, would I determine them to be judging me and punish them? Would I even cast them out? Given my nature, I was surely capable of it. If I didn't repent or change my course, I would become an antichrist, forsaken for offending God's disposition. Yes. After I reflected on these things, I was afraid because of what I had done. I had been a leader for over two years. I never wanted to suppress or hurt God's chosen people. But I was capable of condemning my brothers and sisters. In fact, I had already suppressed someone, done something wicked. I felt deep remorse. So I went before God and prayed to say I was willing to repent and in the future, carry the fear of God in my heart. Seek the truth and act according to principles. Amen. Thank God. Knowing how to obey and learn lessons when you face dealing and pruning seems like such a crucial practice. Yes. Through this pruning and dealing, I also realized that I held mistaken views. I thought that when someone is chosen as a leader, they are better than ordinary brothers and sisters in the church and have the right to speak. And since they do church work, God's chosen people have to support them. I thought even if you see a problem, you shouldn't discuss it with other brothers and sisters. Later, I read a passage of God's Word that changed my views and taught me the role and purpose of leaders and workers in the church. Thank, Thank God. God. I'll read it for you. Okay. okay. 
when someone is chosen to be a leader by the brothers and sisters, or promoted by God's house to do a certain work, or perform a certain duty, this does not mean that they have a special status or identity, or that the truths they understand are deeper and more numerous than those of other people, much less that this person is able to submit to God and will not betray Him. It does not mean either that they know God and are someone who fears God. They have attained none of this, in fact. This is promotion and cultivation in the most direct sense. It simply means they've been promoted and await cultivation. And the ultimate outcome of this cultivation depends on which path the person walks and what they pursue. Thus, when someone in the church is promoted and cultivated to be a leader, they are promoted and cultivated in the straightforward sense. It does not mean that they are already a qualified leader or a competent one, that they are already capable of undertaking the work of a leader and can do real work. That is not the case. When someone is promoted to be a leader, do they possess the reality of the truth? or understand the principles of truth? Can they bring the work arrangements of God's house to fruition? Do they have a sense of responsibility and commitment? Can they submit to God? When they find an issue, can they search for the truth? All of this is unknown. Does the person have a heart that fears God? And just how great is their fear of God? Are they liable to follow their own will when they do things? Can they seek God? While performing the work of leaders, do they regularly and frequently come before God to search for the will of God? Are they able to guide people in entry into the reality of the truth? This and much more all awaits cultivation and discovery. It all remains unknown. Promoting and cultivating someone doesn't mean they already understand the truth. Nor is it saying that they're already capable of performing their duties satisfactorily. So what is the aim and meaning of promoting and cultivating someone? It is that that individual is promoted to be trained, to be specially watered and instructed, so they can understand the principles of the truth and of doing different things and the principles, means, and methods for solving various problems, as well as when they encounter various types of environment and people, how to handle and settle with them according to God's will, protecting the interests of God's house. Does this indicate that the talent promoted and cultivated by the house of God is adequately capable of undertaking their work and performing their duty during the promotion and cultivation period or prior to promotion and cultivation? Of course not. Inevitably, during the cultivation period, they will be dealt with pruned, judged and chastised, exposed or even replaced. This is normal. They are being trained and cultivated. Amen. Amen. God's Word explains it clearly. Yes. yes. I understood from God's Word that when God's house chooses someone to be a leader, it is because this person has a certain caliber, can accept the truth, is responsible in their duties, or shows skill in their work. This allows them to train themselves. But it doesn't mean that they have cast off corruption or have understood the truth. It doesn't mean they are a qualified leader. Nor does it mean that this person is an outstanding individual with any special identity or status in God's house. The duty of being a leader is a commission and a responsibility. It isn't status. When you are a leader, it doesn't mean you have status and the final say in God's house. And you'll be respected and admired by your brothers and sisters, that no one can discuss your issues. Those are mistaken views. Yes. To lead well, we need to accept the supervision and suggestions of our brothers and sisters because this allows us to understand the mistakes we make in our work and rectify them. Beyond that, if brothers and sisters find that leaders don't do practical work, they should practice the truth by exposing such people and protecting church work. This is the right attitude to have towards leaders. Right. 
Treating leaders like this shows principle. Yes. God's word changed my mistaken ideas and notions and showed me how to treat the supervision of God's chosen people and the duty of leadership. Thank God. I wish to turn things around, so from then on, in the course of my duties, no matter who reported problems with leaders and workers, I should handle it carefully. I also should learn to accept more supervision from my brothers and sisters. Later at a meeting, our leader shared the words, Some people attack or condemn the people they see reporting or exposing leaders. Even if such people are normally very serious in their duties, they aren't obedient to God in the slightest. It was especially piercing when I heard that fellowship from my leader. I immediately felt that, despite years of belief in God, I hadn't changed at all. Even now, I wasn't someone who obeyed God, and God was certainly dissatisfied. Listening to my leader's fellowship, I knew it was intended to deal with me, and I couldn't stop my tears from flowing. As I cried, I prayed to God, God, I know you have good intentions in exposing me. Otherwise, I would think my disposition has changed a little and think I am obedient to you. It's only now that I realize I am far from meeting the true standard of obedience to you, but I am willing to pursue being someone who obeys you. Amen. Amen. Later, I read a passage of God's words that was helpful and allowed me to understand God's will. The passage that I found was from the Word appears in the flesh. Let's read it together. Okay. okay. People cannot change their, their own disposition. disposition. They, they must, must undergo God's words, words judging, judging, chastising, chastising suffering, and refining them, them, or dealing with, disciplining, and pruning them. them. Only then can they become obedient and faithful, no longer perfunctory toward God. It is under the refinement of God's words that people's dispositions change. Being exposed, judged, disciplined, and dealt with by His words, they no longer act rashly, but become steady and calm. The most important point is that they are able to submit to God's current words and to submit to His work. And even if it's not in line with human notions, they can put these notions aside and willingly submit. Amen. I understood from God's Word that those who obey God can only do so after experiencing God's judgment, trials, and refinement, then they have achieved a change in their dispositions. While believing in God and performing their duties, such people seek the truth and act on principle when they encounter certain fundamental things. And when they encounter choices on their life path, they are able to base their choice on God's word and the truth. If you only obey God in trivial matters or in outward behaviors, but you act according to your own natural instincts, in the matters of principle or on key issues, then you are still someone who rebels against God. Yes. I used to think I could forsake family and career to work for God, that no matter what duty God's house asked of me, I could accept it, that facing difficulties, I could read God's word and pray and find ways to perform my duties better. And I thought this attitude toward my duties meant that I was obedient toward God. But in the matter of Sister Lou, I saw that I acted blindly and arbitrarily condemned her, proving that my heart was ruled by my satanic disposition. Although I was usually serious and conscientious in my duties, when it came to matters of principles and key issues, I was still rebellious and hostile to God. I saw that I didn't understand the truth at all, my disposition hadn't changed, and I still wasn't obedient to God. Without the dealing of my leader and the revelation of God's word, I wouldn't be able to know myself at all. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Now, in some key matters involving the principles of truth, I consciously seek truth and how to do things according to principles, and I no longer act based on arrogance. Thank God. Mm. I also often pray to God. 
I still have many corrupt dispositions and wrong views. So I need to constantly experience God's judgment, chastisement, pruning, and discipline to achieve change. I pray that God's judgment will never leave me. Then I can understand my rebellion and corruption more deeply and gradually achieve true obedience to God. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God.